all time, but I go higher powers taking a hold on me. Good afternoon, South African. A very warm welcome to you. This is Afternoon Express. My name is Jeannie D. Hi, Bonnie. Hello. I'm Bonnie Mbouli. Okay, so I wasn't into the royal wedding at all. I was like, what? I'm not watching it. I'm not. I'm How busy. are we even friends? And then I started seeing all these pictures coming yes. through, these romantic pictures of them staring into each other's eyes. Oh. And I was like, ah! And then I started searching all of them. <laughs> the royal wedding was just absolutely amazing. I loved how everybody turned out. Uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of her two dresses because I thought she's so magnificent. I would have gone a little bit more extra, but that's my personality. I wasn't a fan of Idris's partner. Oh, dress. Yes. I so didn't like Oprah's what dress. What's going on? <laughs> but the dresses we did love. Okay, the Beckhams. Mm -hmm. I mean, one day I just want to be uh, like a part of that friendship, and I want to yeah. live in Beckingham Palace. I also just want that un with unimpressed Bex. Victoria Beckham look. She's I never smiled. It. I don't think I've ever seen her smile. I, but David Beckham is basically just a king. He yeah, is so, so absolutely. delicious. Love him. <laughs> so there you go. Dreams do come true. Fairy tales do exist. Yeah. And that is my message for That's the Monday morning. That's our recap of the royal wedding. Oh, but today love. we kick off the week with some really inspiring guests. <laughs> Joining us is Sison Kim Simang, who's a prolific journalist and author. She's written articles for the New York Times, The Guardian, Al Jazeera, to name a few. And late last year, she published her memoir called Always Another Country, which tells her story of returning to South Africa from exile. Amazing. Now, recently we started the Mommy Monday feature on Afternoon Express, and today we are introducing a new co-host who will be joining us on a weekly basis to chat about all things Mommy. She's a media personality, entrepreneur, and this year she adds a third new addition to the family after her four-year-old son and two-year-old daughter. So stay tuned to find out more. Plus, we've got a special guest all the way from the USA. He's visited more than 60 countries in his career as a travel blogger and TV personality. Absolutely. Now, Nathan Flewellen is the charismatic creator and co-host, or host actually, of Worldwide Nate, a travel and lifestyle show where he immerses himself in the different cultures of the world. I want him to be my co-host on Top Travel. <laughs> So it is a brand new Mommy Monday series on Afternoon Express. And since we're talking about little ones, Afternoon Express is also having its little birthday of three years old oh. today. So I don't know if you guys noticed that. We've been on air for three years, and so we're celebrating with decadent treats. I just do not want to let go of the weekend, and I want something delicious and decadent. So Clem's not got, got one, but two desserts mm -hmm. for us. Because it's meat-free Monday. Mm -hmm. You know what's meat-free? Dessert. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we're going to make two delicious treats for you today. We're going to make a tiramisu hot milk sponge. Uh -huh. It is crazy good and a dark chocolate cake with a rum buttercream frosting oh yeah all right you know we are going to start dieting in 2019 we've decided that we already decided. we decided 2020 was even the year claim not even 2019 2020, yes. i have pushed it out as far as i can it's going to be absolutely decadent so hope you guys are looking forward to some delicious treats right here on afternoon express as we celebrate a very important day in our lives now, we've mentioned before that we have a travel enthusiast in the loft with us today. He's an adventure junkie and a fitness freak as well with an uh, infectious personality. His name is Nathan Flewellen, and he's traveled to more than 60 countries in his career as a TV vlogger and TV host. Currently, he's on a mission to show off the beauty, diversity, and spirit of Africa to the rest of the world in his brand new travel show worldwide, Nate African Adventures. When I was in college, a professor challenged me to see as much of the world as possible. That was 60 countries and a lot of crazy adventures ago. Now, after sharing my experiences on social media, I'm known as Worldwide Nate. This year, Africa is calling, and I gotta tell you, it's a world like no other.
adventurer. Welcome to the show, Nate. Well, so thanks good to for have having you here. Me. Yeah. What haven't you done? <laughs> just, just about three things. <laughs> what are those three things? <laughs> because I'm pretty sure you're going to get to do them anytime soon. So, I mean, I've, I've tra traveled a lot for TV as well. It is the best, best job in the world. How did you get into it? Well, when I, graduate, when I was graduating from college, a professor had challenged me by giving me his autobiography. He said, and he wrote in the side of the book, I challenge you to see more countries than me and be an entrepreneur. Wow. So when he did that, I was like, oh, I can do that. Because growing up, my mother would go on missionary trips with the church. I had cousins that played professional ball overseas. I had a cousin that spent a summer in Greece. And I had a lot of family members. I have a cousin lives in Macau till this day. So I have a lot of family members that traveled. So as a kid, it was like, oh, I could do that one day. It's just what the older people do. So when my professor challenged me, I was like, oh, it's my time. I'm, I'm of age now. Yeah. And how did you actually monetize your traveling and turn it into a business? What are some of the pillars that you had to make sure were in place? Well, I had to find my voice to create a unique message. Mm. So therefore, I could find my place in the, in the marketplace and be um, just be desirable for people to want to tune in and hear what I have to say. So what I did is I luckily, my cousin was working for this big publication called Ebony Magazine, and they hosted my content on their website because that's when the digital age was coming into, into effect and people needed content. So that was a great opportunity for me to, to learn about working with brands and how to do branded content deals. And then I've been sponsored by Ford, Lincoln Motors. You're uh, not allowed to mention all your sponsors. No. <laughs> so you, you said something very interesting. You mentioned a unique message. Um, and some, sometimes people, I think, in the digital space forget that. They think it's, yeah. it's sell, 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 sell. Right. What is, what is your unique message and why was it important to hone in on it? Well, extreme adventure. Like I've, I've been a person that's not scared of anything or there's things that I wanted to do growing up, but as an adult, it's like I could tap into my childhood and I could finally do those things. Mm. So the extreme adventure around the world, that's what I'm a thrill seeker. And you never are, uh, you know, never short of things you could do around the world. Exactly. And also I'm a professional eater. You know, I've been, <laughs> eat, you know, eating since I came out the womb <laughs> and uh, I love to eat and try different types of food. So food is important. And then also the culture, because we want to be able to not just come to a place and, and take it and just, just come and use the place for its experiences. Yeah. You want to give back and connect with the people and have that cultural exchange. Yeah. So what happens is that as an American, I can come here and I can be a representative so you can see, you know, meet an American, you know, and especially as an African-American, uh, meet, meet me and the people I represent. And then also I can go back to America and say, this is what South Africa has to offer all these other beautiful places around the world. Yeah. I see. How, what, how are some of those ways in that you've given back to some of the places that you visited? Well, I'm excited because I, in one of my episodes, I filmed with the Zulu Surfers with this organization called Surfers Not Street Children and for my show. And I was so inspired by them. I continued surfing and I knew when I came back, I wanted to be able to donate to this organization. So I got a company in the U.S. to donate some wetsuits and surfboards. Wow. And I was able to bring those to those kids uh, a couple weeks ago in, in, South, uh, in Durban. Yeah. So it's um, every time I come back, I want to come to Durban and being a, be able to donate some wetsuits and surfboards because these kids, they have this fearless energy where it's time to surf. They jump in the, in the water and they just attack these waves and it, and it prevents them. It helps them to have something to do and not turn their energy towards things that could be negative. Yeah. yeah. You also did some stick fighting while you were there as well. Yeah, apparently you're a yeah. stick fighting professional. <laughs> yeah, it just came instinctively. You know, I, I took my DNA test and I found out I'm partially South African. So I really? think it was just wow. my ancestral blood was just pumping. Yeah, I, d I did think you looked a bit Zulu. But I did my <laughs> DNA test, I've got blue blood, definitely. <laughs> but, I mean, th this might not have happened to you because you've traveled a lot, but what are some of the misconceptions that Americans have about Africa that you want to uh, address, yeah. Well, something as simple as food. My cousin, he, uh, he, I showed him a, a video of me staying at this, uh, this oyster box hotel in Durban, and he said, "Oh, please uh, post the food so we can see what they eat." And I'm like, "Well, they eat food just like we do, you know." And this is funny for somebody to say that because I mean, we came from Africa. It's not like Africans <laughs> forgot how to eat. 
<laughs> we don't eat food the same as the Americans. We have way smaller portions. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Ritter, you also are a fitness enthusiast as well. As yes. As, as well as a foodie. How do you maintain the balance of staying in such great shape when you're traveling to such amazing places and definitely tasting such fine things? Absolutely. Well, I always like to try to get out and explore the city by running so you can kill two birds with one stone. You can stay healthy, but you can always see the city. Mm. But then sometimes I may not feel like running, so I just get on the floor and do some push-ups and some crunches. Sure. And it's almost, I call it the prayer crunch, because it's like I'm praying that I can make it through so I can stay in shape. How do you do the prayer crunch? What, what do you he mean by that? that you, he you do that? Just, it's just a crunch. It's just hoping that, oh, you know, okay. just don't give up. It's <laughs> <laughs> praying that he doesn't like that. <laughs> Coming after the break, <laughs> Chef Clem makes a classic Italian dessert, tiramisu, and it's time to reveal our new guest co-host for the Afternoon Express Mommy Monday feature. So stay right there. Loma fresh milk is way better. Made with love by Clover. Welcome back to Afternoon Express on this Monday afternoon. We're live on SABC3, and it's an honor to be spending our afternoons with you. And I thought to treat you, I'd make you something decadent. A heavenly taste and earthly goodness are the terms that best describe the dis deliciousness of clover milk. With added vanilla extract, it's a milk that can be indulged hot or cold or on its own. Today, it is the hero ingredient in our scrumptious tiramisu sponge cake. How yummy does that sound? You do not want to miss out on this recipe, so SMS the keyword clover to 33650 at a cost of 1 Rand 50. Remember, those free SMSs don't apply, and you'll get the ingredients sent directly to your mobile device. It definitely is a cake uh, like take on an Italian dessert recipe where obviously we always make it in my family home. Clem, show yeah. us how it's done. I like how you said you making this. Well, I, I always try and assist. I will always say that you give <laughs> up the recipe. He shows us the goodness, but the whole idea of being a chef is teaching others, right? Absolutely, and that's what I love doing. I love teaching others to cook. So let's talk about what's going on right mm. now. So in this pot, I've got some melted butter and some milk. Mm, milk. And I like how they've put that. It's milk because I mean, when you smell it, yeah. it's like, Mm. 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 Joking, I'm kidding. <laughs> I buy that stuff all the time, like almost at least once a week. I always take one off the shelf. It's like one of my favorite pastime treats or high protein sort of like. It's snacks. really delicious mm. and really good. 
This is then good for you. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So I've added some extra milk to that. And you have got some eggs and some sugar that I've whisked together. Cool. So what is the purpose of adding the butter and the milk to heat it up? Uh, why wouldn't you add butter to everything? Well, no, it's just to, just to melt the yeah. butter into it. To you, get want that the butter to melt, you want the butter to melt into it, mm -hmm. and then obviously butter and cakes, you know, the richness, delicious I flavor. See. So instead of melting your, your butter in the, uh, the microwave, you're kind of mixing it in already. Exactly. You gotcha. could do it in the microwave if you wanted to, but gotcha. I mean, we love using the stove. So, cool. To this, we're going to add our butter and milk mixture. Mm. Just smell that, okay? With the butter. Isn't that really crazy? Yum. That is so good. Oh, just like that. Uh. Melt Kay. some butter and throw in some milk, I'll drink it. There we go. So you're going to mix it all together. <laughs> Cholesterol through the roof. <laughs> through the roof today. Will you add some of the flour for me? Sure, I can. Just normal cake flour? It is. Mix Obviously, one up. of the cool trips I always learned was trying to sift your flour beforehand. So we've sifted ours. We have. Uh, just beforehand. It's always a great way to prevent some of those clumps that you get inside the packets. Yeah, no one wants so. a clumpy cake. Mm -mm. No. Well, like <laughs> when you bite it, a or like with Portuguese rolls, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 yeah. that's not going to happen today, okay? <laughs> so it's a beautiful ma batter, it is nice and runny. This is one of the simplest batters you can ever make. Okay. And also, you asked about the milk being warm, mm. this is called a hot milk sponge cake. And I think it's something about the, the milk and how it tenderizes the proteins inside the cake with the flour and makes it so delicious and moist. Tenderizing proteins inside Look the cake. Look at us. We wow. are just full of... Science full lesson on Afternoon Express. <laughs> Check the price of one. There we go. So what I like doing is I've got these cute... Uh, guys can say cute, okay? Yes, they can. Cute little buntins. They can say cute, but they can't be called cute. So ladies, learn. No. <laughs> Don't call the guys cute. No. Handsome is fine. Yeah, not cute. And you're going to just spoon that in there. Cool. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention, in the flour, I had a little bit of baking powder already sifted oh, together. Oh, help it raise. There we go. Cool. So Rise. that's going to go into the oven, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then, what I've done is I've made this amazing syrup. So we've got, here comes the tiramisu pot. We've got some milk, mm -hmm. okay, icing sugar, coffee liqueur, and some coffee. Oh, yeah. Sound crazy, right? If you want to, obviously, alcohol-free, perhaps, can you just eliminate the alcohol liqueur for more coffee? And just use coffee. Nice. So what I do Good is idea. I... Take a little bit of that. Oh. While your sponge is still hot, start ladling that over. Oh, I see. It'll oh. just suck all of that up. Exactly. Mm. So this one's had a few layers before. So let me just show you what it looks like when you turn it over. Look how pretty oh, that that's is. so cool, Cam. It'll also hold a lot of whatever you're going to put on top because it's got now like exactly. an outing. Exactly. And when you turn it up, all that like moisture is mm. going to drip mm. down to the bottom. Then, because we don't even have coffee in this, I've made a beautiful glaze with mascarpone or... Mascarpone. Mascarpone. <laughs> icing sugar. Um, <laughs> some more milk and some coffee liqueur again, and some oh, normal coffee, it's super light delicious. in there. And this is gonna kind of be like the mascarpone element of the tiramisu. so please do try it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. It's crazy, mm, right? That is heaven. So, <laughs> so our sandwich is, is done, it's crazy, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I sandwich the two together, pour the glaze over, a little bit of extra chocolate on there. You have to try this, it is so, so easy. It is so decadent at the same time as well. It's I'm crazy. I'm so lucky that you managed to make this and I get to taste these and you get to try it. So that's my favorite thing about being on the show is always trying the delicious dishes. And what I love about you making this recipe is I really don't like sponge cakes. We've well, moistened this up now by pouring that syrup over. Mm. I think it might become my new favorite thing. It is honestly such a treat. So if you want this recipe and you want it on your mobile device, then you SMS the key keyword Clover to double three six five zero at a cost of one rand fifty, and your free SMSs don't apply. And in case you missed it and want to have one of your very own, here's a recap.
Made with love by Clover. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. As soon as your pregnancy begins, apart from thinking of baby names, you have to start thinking about where and how you want your baby delivered and whether or not you should choose a midwife, a doula, a doctor to assist you during the pregnancy. And most women do have the knowledge of the different don't or do have the knowledge of the different options available to them these days. But we'll be exploring that today and finding out about all the options available to you. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. So lovely to get a chance to chat to you and to sit next to my fellow mommy and <laughs> just dive into the conversation because this is this is baby number three. So so now I'm feeling a little bit calmer, but I remember the first time you hear or you see those little lines and you see that you're pregnant. What are the first things that you should actually be thinking about when preparing for the arrival of your new little bundle of joy? Well, I would say looking into your choices for who's going to be your care provider, where you want to give birth, also looking at your options in terms of screening tests, whether you want them or not. It's much more important than the kind of the nursery, really. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, okay, so when I remember when I was pregnant, um, I thought to myself, I definitely just want a home birth. I want, uh, I want water and I want to be in my, in my, like my comfort zone, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why mm -hmm. I wanted to do it at home. Your happy place. Yes, but when I finally found my midwife who was incredible, um, and you happen to know her, um, she also said to me, we have to have an obstetrician guiding us through this mm. as well, in case anything goes wrong, we just need to have her on standby. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how important is this? Should I answer that Yes. One? Well, I want to go back to your thing about when you first get those positive, those positive stripes. It's actually, don't overthink it. You're mm. pregnant, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. It's a very unpredictable path mm -hmm. with a fairly unpredictable, no, the, the outcome's mostly predictable with an un, un, unpredictable path. So mm -hmm. don't overthink it, actually. Mm -hmm. Relax a little bit, just enjoy it. Many women like you do have a feeling, I'd like to do it like this, but I've got zillions of years experience. I can't predict the outcome, neither can you. So you want to be in the care of someone you trust mm -hmm. who's going to walk that path with you sensibly. And yes, who can deliver your baby? Anyone who's qualified to do it. Be it a GP with obstetric experience, be it a qualified midwife, be it a gynecologist. I'm qualified to do more than the low risk normal birth. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to look at yourself. So just coming back very quickly to that is there may be things about you, your health, your previous history of having children that means it's not appropriate to have a normal home birth. So you need to have a look at those broad limitations. Um, but yeah, just to enjoy the pregnancy, don't overthink it too much. Yeah, it's also amazing with, with motherhood, there's so much um, almost judgment that comes into every aspect of it. And it starts even from, from the beginning, like how does one give birth? You know, mm. everybody has an opinion on how you bring your child into the world. But I suppose at the end of the day, it's, it's what works for you and what's the medically most safe way to do for your child at that point in time. But I wanted to find out, I mean, doulas, it's, it's doulas, midwives, obstetricians, all the different people available to patients in state. Are patients in state adequately prepared to know what they can ask for when mm. it comes to birthing their child? Mm. That's a difficult one to uh -huh. answer <laughs> um, about how prepared they are. It is a system that they go through. So they don't have a lot of choice. Mm. If they are low risk, they are mm. cared for by midwives. If a complication uh, develops, then they are referred to the obstetricians at the hospitals. In a lot of our units in Cape Town, there are doulas who are women who are trained to give birth support, who are volunteer time mm -hmm. in the MOUs, midwife obstetric units, where the low risk women go, and also into the hospitals like Somerset and Mowbray, which is brilliant because we yeah. know that constant mm -hmm. support in labor mm -hmm. makes a big difference. It does. What are the trends around childbirth in, in South Africa at the moment? Are people moving away from kind of doulas and midwives and more towards obstetricians, or is it happening the opposite way, or is it just actually an a, 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 yeah, yeah. equal I amount? I think it's the opposite way. I think, it, you know what, it depends on the cohort you're talking about. Mm -hmm. In my practice, I would say it's the other way. Women are looking, are feeling that they're being sort of pushed into a medical model and are looking at other options. Mm -hmm. But it does depend where you come from because coming back to state compared to worldwide if we look worldwide the figures are tragic there are many women who have no choices and they don't mm -hmm. have access mm -hmm. to care South African state 
it has a good model and that model is that if you are low risk you deliver in a unit with a midwife mm. now that's what a lot of people are seeing as the ideal but mm. remember they do not have the choice mm. if you want to have a cesarean with an epidural at critical you cannot mm. because you mm. do not live in the area and you're not high risk um, so I think for, for the in the ideal world it's about offering choice Mm. and informing women what are your th safe choices. Mm. Yeah. So, but I think that if you took a gynecologist from somewhere else in South Africa, you may get a very different answer. Mm. What, yeah. what is your feeling about, yeah, I think we both do mm. work, uh, uh, the, the women that we see a lot of are women who are exploring their choices mm. and are often look, looking to vaginal birth. Yes, they, that's what they want, and so they're looking for the, care providers that suit their philosophy. Fantastic. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you Joe, managed you to have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking, so you, you managed to have that idyllic situation with having a water birth and having the... I mean, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it idyllic in terms of like the pain and the drama. <laughs> I was about there to was say, so you, much I drama. knew you were strong, and but I was strong. being dramatic the yeah. whole time and my midwife was incredible. She sat mm. by me for eight hours mm -hmm. and she just kept saying to me, okay, this is the phase we're in. Stop playing victim, just mm. show up. You're mm. giving birth to the baby. This isn't mm. happening to you. Mm -hmm. So she knew when to prompt me, when to hold back. And it was That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. But mm. I didn't take painkillers. So I was like, wow. ah! <laughs> you went through Has the you, whole have you been nervous about we, what kind well, of birth to have i think i think the thing is for me i'm married to an orthopedic surgeon so my, my husband is in the medical you know mm. family but we tried we tried this natural birth with our with our first child and you know when when push comes to shove i think one all realizes or everybody realizes that you have to do what's best for the mom's health and for the baby's health mm. so sometimes your birth plan doesn't go according to your plan but yes. at the end of the day, as you said, we, we spend so much time planning the nurseries and the names and so on. We have to actually just have realistic expectations mm. of how we bring our child into the mm. world. Mm. So Absolutely. I'm super excited. I'm like, yeah, yeah five weeks to go. I five hope. weeks to go <laughs> and you come. <laughs> or you're paddling back. I'm paddling. <laughs> <laughs> for, for women at home who are close to giving birth or are thinking about their choices, the choices available to them, what should they consider realistically? starts, I mean, it, it, this is very boring and practical. You're going to look at funding. Mm. So the model of women who are low risk giving birth in a unit that is managed by midwives um, with a backup obstetrician is not necessarily how it works. Mm. Um, so you must look what your funding is. Are you paying this out of your pocket? Do you have medical aid? Do you have gut cover? And what do they mm. co cover? Because unfortunately, mm. that is one of the limitations. Mm. And if you don't, you need to look at what it's going to cost you and can you afford it. Mm. So there's some very, very practical mm. things. Mm. Um, so there. Um, Angela is a, is a qualified midwife. She's in private practice. She's qualified to do a normal birth and also to do home births. So she's not employed by a hospital mm. per se. Mm. There are many midwives who are employed by hospitals. But does your ma medical aid cover the cost of that? Mm. Um, yes, there will always, will always be a requirement to have a backup gynecologist. Mm. Does the hospital you are thinking of delivering at allow a midwife based del delivery, not all do. Mm. So there's quite a lot of sort of practical things you've got to get your head around. Mm. Yeah. That's true. Any surprises, Joe, along the way? I think for me, I think nothing prepares you for how vulnerable you are at that mm. moment that your child comes into the world. I, I think mm. you never realize mm. what it means to truly care. And, and mm. I, I remember when, when our son came out, Noah, our first one, um, the look on my husband's face because he he just went into daddy mode and when the baby came out he wasn't sure should he stay with me or should mm. he go with the baby it's like all of a sudden he mm. realized that one person had become two and he, his loyalty lay with the baby he ran towards towards the baby but i think that that vulnerability surprised me because yes. all of a sudden you realize it doesn't matter what happens to you you just want the best possible mm. outcome yeah. for your baby yeah. it definitely mm. is such a vulnerable moment it reminds me so much of my moment when Baba came out and um, the midwife was um, trying to get him to cry or smacking mm. him, smacking his bum to get him to, to breathe and he, he wouldn't <laughs> breathe. Oh, <no. laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to look at this. I'm mm. not going to look at this. What mm. is happening? And eventually mm. he did come around. But 
you know, it was it, it's, it's such a vulnerable moment because mm. you want everything to be so perfect. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think with that vulnerability, it's important that you have a good trust relationship with your care providers. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And to so also spend some time with them before the actual birthing process, yes. if you can, if it yes. is viable. Because if you, you have that good trust, mm. you can just relax and let Enjoy, go and birth yeah. and Enjoy not worry the about it. <laughs> yeah. it you know. yeah. 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 Well, yeah. thank you so much, ladies, for joining us today. It's a pleasure. <laughs> So we'll be back again next week with Joanne for another edition of Mommy Monday, unpacking the challenges faced by new moms. And after the break, we sit down with the inspiring author, Susan Gimsima.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, as a journalist and political commentator, Sison Kim Simang has penned articles for some of the world's biggest publications, including the New York Times, The Guardian, and Al Jazeera. Yeah, her work focuses on race, gender, and human rights. And last year, she released her first book called Always Another Country, a memoir of exile and home, which tells her story of being raised on the move from Swaziland, Zambia, and Kenya to Canada and the US until finally settling in South Africa. Welcome to Afternoon Express. Thank you. You are just such an incredible writer. Oh, thank you. Like, do, do you think, like, to become a great writer, do you think it's because of genuine, genuine interest in the world, or did you used to read a lot as a child? So I won't accept being a great writer, although I'm a writer who's trying to become great. Yeah. Um, but I will say it's both. You have to both be interested in reading, and yeah. I read voraciously as a child, yeah. everything from, like, Little Women, to Enid Blyton, mm. to like much more complicated texts the older I got. Yeah. Um, and I was a big fan of libraries as a kid. Yeah. Um, but also that I'm interested in the world. So I read yeah. very widely. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. You've just been nominated for an Alan Payton Thank for um, nonfiction. Thank Are you, you excited? I am excited. Um, but one of the things that publishing the book uh, has taught me is to um, have your own sense of whether you're proud or not. So I'm proud of having written the book, um, but I try not to get too caught up in other in people's... The awards. Yeah, 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 in other yeah. people's excitement, because if, you're, if, you, if it gets to your head when people are excited and it gets to your head when people don't like your book, then you're constantly going like yeah. this. And then I your journey is not your own, really. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So Always Another Country, very interesting um, title. And it, it grabbed me the, m the minute I heard it. Because I remember just as a, as a, as a child, or, or rather as an adult, always moving. I, I move a lot. I've moved a lot in my life. And I thought, when, when I saw Always Another Country, I thought, oh, Bonnie, always another house. <laughs> and and does that, does that, that, that title brought a certain amount of displacement? Yeah. And is, is that one of the themes? Yeah, so in some ways the book is like um, a love letter to this country. Um, so it's about always being in another country and always wanting to be in this country. So you mm. can read it that way. But it, it's very much, as you say, moving from house to house. So it's also like a l tiny series of little stories about moving to another house and then having your parents say, OK, girls, it's time to go again. And you're like, wow, I just made friends. Yeah. I just mm. started to get used to this country. And then you've got to go again. So it's, it's about how through all of those different movings, um, my family, and particularly with m the role of my mother, you know how mothers are, keeping us together and keeping us mm. sane and keeping us feeling as though the places may have changed, but we were always the same. Mm. Mm. Your, your voice is tremendously wise, uh, I think, in, in the book. And, but it must have been quite a cathartic experience for you as well. Why did you decide to write it? So I, um, I wrote the book uh, in this way, as a memoir, rather than a collection of political yeah. essays. Uh, for a couple of reasons. The main one was that I think everyone expected me to write a book of, of political essays because I'm you know, constantly talking about current affairs and politics in South Africa. And so I like to not meet people's expectations and I wanted to push myself as a writer. So it was a challenge to write it. So that was the one. But the second one is because you know, as South Africans, we really have a history that's full of big men. Um, Nelson Mandela, Bishop Tutu, mm -hmm. uh, Walter Sisulu, <coughs> um, Furfut. Um, so you have these big men who animate our political landscape. And I wanted to say that as an ordinary young woman, our stories are important too. Mm -hmm. That it's the small stories that make South Africa such an interesting place. And so I wanted to kind of um, have a focus on, on tiny little micro stories. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And have you ever, f um, if you, do you feel now a place, a sense of South Africa belongs to me and I belong to South Africa? Or, or is, there, is there always almost like an, an ex exile atmosphere that, yeah. that prevails in one's life? That's a good question. So I think being someone who has lived in many parts of the world makes me a person who is able to move easily and make friends quickly. So I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But it also means that I am, but, but you can't undo your history. You can't undo your personal history. So there's no street that I can go to where everybody knows my name and says, oh, we remember when you were this high, ah, right? right? So I have people who have that memory of me from place to place, but I don't have that 
groundedness in a particular place. Wow. So I, so in some ways it's sad, and then in other ways I say I always say to people, but th what that means is that because I am so profoundly South African, because my life was lived because of this idea of South Africa, I am very South African, even as I have no particular place in South Africa that I can peg my yeah. my, my feet to. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. so interesting. We're going to have another uh, segment of, and another interview with you to get to know a little bit more about you and, of course, your amazing book. We'd love talking yeah. to you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back uh, with more from Sisonke after the break. Plus, we've got a very special Afternoon Express third birthday surprise to share with you, so stay right where you are. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. We are back on the couch with Susong M. Simang, a riveting and prolific writer and journalist. You're gonna, you, uh, you're so modest. You're gonna say, I don't know about prolific. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about prolific. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about some of the incidents that take place in the book. Like mm -hmm. the first one is you hiding behind the stairs and overhearing somebody speak ill of your mom and your family, and how it sent your world into this like mm. existential crisis about your familial relationships. Tell us about that. So, I mean, one of the things about being a girl child uh, in this world, but particularly, you know, growing up in Africa, is that, um, you know, you have people making comments about, in our family, we were three girls, so making comments about feeling, oh, shame, there's no boy in your family. And because of the way my parents 
raised us and the way I grew up, we did everything with my parents, and particularly my dad was a very yeah. hands-on, revolutionary, at some points unemployed <laughs> father. <laughs> and so my, it was kind of reversed. So my mother was the one who went out and earned income in our very, very earliest years. And so, you know, this, the first scene in, in, in the book where I describe coming across the gossipers. You know that every neighborhood has the gossipers. Oh, yeah. and, and so what the gossipers do is they are the ones who teach children the messages that your parents don't teach you, the negative messages. So your parents focus on making you strong and building you up and feeling like and the you can do anything in this world. Break it and down. then the gossipers break it down. Oh, and so, so I think in some ways, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated about my parents is that when the real world intruded to try to give us its bad messages, they always knew how to reassert um, mm. the sense in ourselves that we were mm. worth something, that we were mm. valuable, mm. Um, that we, they weren't just happy because we happened to be girls, they were happy because we were girls. Yeah. Wow, Another one in the, in the book is where there was a sexual assault with, with uh, somebody who worked the gardener, in the yeah. garden. And what was so funny was your perception of him. It wasn't, you didn't take the stance of a victim. You thought, you felt sorry for him. So I think that, um, Unfortunately, in South Africa, as in many other parts of the world, we live uh, at a time when rape culture is so strong and where sexual violence is something that women and girls encounter on a daily basis. And what you'll find is that many women encounter multiple acts of, mm. of violence. It's not just one. Um, so the reality is there are things that are outside of our control as parents that we can't help that will happen to our children. Yeah. Mm. And so one of the things that I wanted to demonstrate is that while sexual assault is something that happened to me, it's something that didn't define me. Mm. And the reason why it can define the lives of so many women is that uh, it's repeated over and over again, and that there um, is no internal resilience because we, uh, for whatever reasons, our families don't always give us all of the tools, you know, like a backpack yeah. of love and nurturing mm. and strength and resilience. And so where you are resilient, when bad things happen to you, you have a capacity to live through them. Mm. Where you aren't resilient, those things uh, define you. Um, so in many ways, what I wanted to do with the book was to talk about good things and bad things, but to talk about what is the inner core that it's going to take in ourselves to be able to see bad things through. Mm. Yeah. So you're in an interracial marriage. So I know, I know from experience with interracial relationships and being an outspoken person who's a social activist, who has strong political views, people kind of struggle with the duality of that. They want you to have a singular narrative. And I find like even on my social media pics, people will comment, uh, why are you dating a slave master? Just dumb stuff, right? But what, what is the <laughs> conversation? I love it. The <laughs> <laughs> Do they know no, she's she's a slave master. <laughs> who's whipping who? <laughs> who's whipping? <laughs> who's your daddy? <laughs> but you know, so, but, but you've had an, an internal <laughs> dilemma about that. I did. Look, <laughs> I was like a, 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 a radical, you know, Biko when I came home uh, from the U.S. I had just been, uh, for the first time, living really as an adult in a country where black people are the minority and that defines your sense of self very differently mm. than in South Africa where the where the majority um, and so I came back into sort of South African rainbow nation and everyone was happy and there was Madiba mm. and I was like no but <laughs> what about us black people <laughs> you know so I was very outspoken and then of course karma has a way of doing its number on you and then it sends you someone who you didn't expect to fall mm. in love with um, which I think doesn't curtail your capacity to talk about what the truth is. Um, I was doing some research for a paper I'll be giving uh, later this week, and I was like, ooh, I didn't know that Steve Biko had some white lovers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. mm. Mm. <laughs> so I also think there's a way in which uh, there's an expectation around uh, uh, women, uh, black women, who you're supposed to be with, what it means to be a good woman. Um, your allegiance in love, so to speak. Your allegiance in yeah. love is your mm. allegiance to nation. Uh, mm. that, that I think that expectation isn't always a standard that men are held up to. Wow. You are quite a woman. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> you are so amazing. Thank you so much for being Thank here today. Thank you so much, And guys. best of luck with your book. Thank you. And the much. next one. Go and the next one. Read it. And, and read it. <laughs> read it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're going to be back after this with our birthday surprise. I love it.
Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Time really does fly when you're having fun. And today, Afternoon Express turns three years Woo! old. It's crazy. Yay! For almost 700 episodes, we brought you the best in lifestyle <laughs> entertainment and delicious treats in the kitchen. And what better way to celebrate than to make a birthday cake? Absolutely. Yes. And in the meantime, we've become such a family. We've become such great. Oh. Mm. Oh. Can't get in here. Clem, Clem, <laughs> Clem's a feeder, yeah. he okay. feeds us. It's it's awesome. You guys ready to start baking? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So in front of you, we've got some eggs and chocolate. I'm going to add some buttermilk to this. Ooh. By the way, do you, know, you know what we're making, right? No. It's a decadent dark chocolate. Uh, Bonnie, <laughs> it's a dark chocolate cake <laughs> with a rum cream cheese frosting <laughs> icing, okay? Rum so Jeannie, cream cheese uh, Jeannie, frosting. give those piping bags. Do the, you know there's icing in there, and there's rum in there, and there's cheese in there. Give it to me. Thank you. <laughs> That's all your favorite things. All right, so if you can mix this up for me. Yeah, me. Anyone. Whoever. Bonnie, Bonnie, Bonnie. 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 Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, just give it to the help. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. That's funny. Wow. Okay, okay. Jeannie, while, while, Bonnie, while Bonnie's doing that, Turkish? could you add the top layer of cake to our already two layers? Okay. Sorry, what? I'm going to add another layer on top on of here. that, right? You want to squash Both what already looks so pretty. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you can take the paper off for me first. There okay, we go. and I'm so going to... Upside down, upside down. Upside there down. There we go. The reason oh. upside down is because you want a nice flat it's surface really to moist. decorate. Mm. So now I'm going to actually... You know what? I'm actually going to give you the piping bag back. Okay. You can and now I'm decorate it yep. however you want. Bonnie, you're onto See, something Bonnie, agreeable. Dan, help. I've got some... I was teasing. The Portuguese girls make the cake. You know I love you. You know I love you. All right, so to that, if you can add the salt to... That so this is a coffee style. We're adding alcohol. If you do not want alcohol, you can just use what coffee, coffee. as a yes. separate coffee one. Coffee is everything today, right? Mm. How yeah. amazing is that? Yeah. Right, that Bonnie, how are you doing? So yum. Bonnie, you are looking so good. so good. I'm gonna add this some vanilla. This smells so good, guys. It does. Although it's our cake, I guess it's yours as well. If you want to make it, it's not like one of these recipes you're gonna keep to ourselves. Uh, you guys can SMS the keyword treats to double three six five zero to cost of one rand fifty, and this recipe will make its way to your mobile device. Okay, cool. Dan, I don't mean to be funny, but have, like this is, I'm doing such a great job. You yeah, are. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty yeah, impressed. Yeah. yeah. All right, <laughs> Dan. Now, can you add? Well, Bonnie pours that into our dry ingredients, which is cocoa, sugar, mm -hmm. flour. Will you mix it? With sure. your spatula. Yeah. With this. Oh, with this spatula. spatula. You should be able to do it with the spatula. If it gets a bit... Dan, just make a little well in the middle so right. I can pour the liquid in. There Thank we you. go. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie, you're looking good. Jeannie, you're fine. Dan? I'm yes, great. I'm there looking good so far. Actually, I'm typing hot right now. This is fine. <laughs> Yum. There you go. Yeah. So basically, because we've turned three, we've decided that this is going to be like our whole birthday month. Because my birthday, my, literally, I celebrated the whole month. It was amazing. But we'd like to know from you at home as well. Like, what have you loved throughout the last few, few years? What's been your favorite moments, your highlights? What do you love so, about the show? And also, we do yeah. accept presents. We do accept money. Oh, gifting. Gifting. Huge. Yeah. Huge. Money. The address is on our website. Yeah. Just, just write Jeannie or Bonnie or Dan yeah. or Clem. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we'll all be in there. Yeah, we'd love to know. Because, I mean, we've had some okay, incredible guests on the show. We've made now. some amazing recipes. We've done so much cool stuff on this show over the we last have. few years. We have. I don't know if it would be possible for us to even select our own favorites. Absolutely. What, what do you love most about the show? Oh, definitely the cooking. Oh, really yeah. I'm so good at it. <laughs> but Jeannie, you know, honestly, you've learned a lot. No, I, th I thought I had, but I can't even do a little circle. No, there. that's how you do it. I'm that's really how you do it. We're starting off so well, and now it's probably messed you, up. They were starting out like all like pointy and cute, and now they're like. Yeah, can you tell? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get them pointy again. Because, because I've worked with you guys for so long, I've learned what my favorite thing is about the show. Yeah. Working alongside Jeannie and Bonnie. That's Yay! my real answer. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's the one no it's not. Me really, come one. on, come on. I don't know. I just really enjoy having really smart conversation. I think we've had some amazingly smart guests on our on it's our. It's something you we weren't used to before. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> not my friends. You know, <laughs> but it's been really cool to have some of those conversations. We've unpacked some amazing issues in South Africa. Absolutely. And it's been cool to Absolutely. tackle them. And for you, Bon? For me, done? it's definitely our guests. I think um, yeah. I've, I've met. We've met such an array of people on the show. People mm. who've taught us so much. People have just opened up our minds and, yeah. and changed yeah. our way of looking at things. Um, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's come at a point in my life where I really needed to hear that particular mm -hmm. message or that particular mm -hmm. story that day. So thank you so much to all our guests <laughs> and of course our viewers. We love you. <laughs> I've got to show you, look at that things. one little... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll put that one towards the back. It's like a little draw. All right, put oh, that towards the back. Now, Bonnie, okay. if you can actually pop the sparkles on there, I've got the fire. 
And we're yes. going to light that up, but not right now. I think we'll do that into the show. All right, okay. fine. In the meantime, okay, if you guys fine. want to get this S recipe, then make sure you SMS the keyword TREAT to 33650. It'll cost you one rand fifty, and the free SMSs won't apply. All the details will be sent directly to your device. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And just like that, we turn three years old and start. Yay! Don't burn yourself. Don't I burn will yourself. I not burn myself. I oh, am. Oh, that's so great. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, dear Arnie and Chris. Happy birthday to us. It's been, it really has been awesome working alongside both of you. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you to you guys, honestly, for being part of our family. Uh, you guys have really been such a big part of the conversation absolutely. on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We absolutely adore you every afternoon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, join us again tomorrow for the Afternoon Express. Cook along as we put together a classic meal of fish and chips along with our special guest, jazz artist, Zoe Mudija. It's going to be okay, absolutely awesome. Okay, now I can't awesome. contain myself any longer because a triple deck. Did you see the royal cake? At no, the wedding. I did not. It was just covered in flowers. It was so beautiful. And it was wow. Like, oh, oh, wow. Oh. Three years, this three layers. This is our royal cake. Yeah, this was a royal. Del like. I can't do it. would you like this slice? That looks like the perfect size for me. It's been go. a Monday of hell. So this is perfect. Mm, there you go. Wow. Let me show what that looks like. South Africa, can you, you deal? Look at that. Amazing. Yummy. Thank you, guys. I'll be back tomorrow for the cook along. See oh, you, you then. Good night. Happy eating. Ciao. Mm. Oh, wow. Can I have a slice? Made with love by Clover. A never feel good production.